writing a fuck yes life brief means that you're writing a series and no more than five declarative statements that are anchored in the right here, right now. So what I mean by that is you start each of these statements with, I am, I choose, I am ready for. This is not a wish list, a bucket list, someday, if, when, you know? This is about what is urgent and important bundled up now. Bonnie Wan, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Sean. It's so wonderful to be here. So we're going to talk today about the concept of having a strategy for our lives. But before we dive into the specifics there, I want to paint a picture because lots of people listening to this, particularly at the beginning of a new year, might think that they already have a strategy for their life, right? They have some kind of broad goals that they set. Maybe they have some New Year's resolutions. They're going to wake up tomorrow and they're going to have a to-do list or they can look at their calendar and they know what they're doing in any given day. But how is that different to having a strategy for your life? And if somebody's listening, how can they identify that they're perhaps missing a strategy? Mm, Such a good question. So as a lifelong career strategist for companies, um, there are lots of different kinds of strategies. So New Year's resolutions, goals, those are all good things to have because it's the beginning of us reflecting on The driving question for the life brief, which is inspired by my work as a brand strategist, but apply to people and all the different areas of our lives that matter most. Um, And it always starts with the question of what do I want? That to me is the most penetrating question. The work I do with companies, questions are my best friends as a strategist. So we tend to, you know, drive everything we do through questions and curiosity. How do we unpack the ambition that a company has and how do we match that with who they are at their very essence? So as a brand strategist, my job is to understand the essence of a company and then match that with their expressed ambition, which we can call in our own personal lives, so many different things, goals, resolutions, etc. But for me, life strategy is operates at a higher level. It's rising above the noise of the day to day. We can have a daily goal. We can have a to do list, as you said, a bucket list, a dream list, you know, um, but there's a little, there's a deeper layer to this work which is really understanding who you are at your essence and connecting to what you want in the boldest, bravest ways from that deep place of truth. And so for me, the best life strategies or life briefs, as I call them, are ones that are sharp, memorable, I call them sharp and sticky. They're big and bold. They're nakedly honest and they're imminently flexible. So they do not guide every single thing you do, but they guide and help you make decisions on the biggest choices in your life. And because they are expressed in an invigorating, I call it fuck yes way, you know, where it gives you, you read your brief and we can talk more about what is that, what does a brief actually look like for for your life? Um, But when you read it back to you, yourself, you get this feeling of aliveness, uh, a sensation that maybe exhibits itself in goosebumps. Maybe it's a fire in your belly. Maybe it's butterflies or a sense of nervousness, but an excitedness. But the sense that, God, I want this so badly, I can't imagine living the rest of my life without it. And that, as a driver, penetrates all sorts of decisions, all sorts of choices. And it almost becomes automatic when you have something that is so deep from a calling that is within you. 
So it seems that, at least in today's society, many of us just return to defaults, right? Whether that's through the education system, not really telling us that we have permission to go out and design our own lives in the way you speak about, whether that's mimetic desire making us think that we want the things other people want, rather than to return to your question, want what we want. We don't stop to say, what do I actually want from this life? What do you think some of the causes are that, that make it that so many people are walking around without a brief of their life? Well, we're out of practice. We're never invited to practice in the first place. Um, I think it starts in childhood, sometimes out of very good intention, out of love and safety and protectedness, that we are taught how to operate in the world, in a world of expectation, in a world um, of unspoken rules. There are rules to our cultures, um, and depending on who you are in the culture, uh, they. Uh, from the start, our parents teach us how to navigate within those rules to protect us as children. And then once we get into school, our natural innate curiosities um, are overshadowed by the need to be good, to be a good student, follow the rules, color inside the lines, play inside the sandbox. Uh, but being human is innately messy. Uh, it's irrational. I deal with this all the time in marketing, right? Um, if we were actually truly rational beings, we wouldn't buy anything <laughs> and we wouldn't have the opportunity to um, sell people services and stuff um, as we do you know, in the, in the marketing world. But because human beings are emotional, dare I say spiritual, and deeply irrational, it comes into conflict with being raised in um, a society that wants us to be rational and wants us to paint inside a line. So we are deeply out of practice. I wish that we were asked and asking our children what they want and helping them practice that connection to that inner voice that is a guide. And when you see children, I have four of them, when you see them in their natural state as they come into the world and as they as you fascinate about on children you see their innate curiosity they are driven absolutely by their inner instincts and their inner guidance but somehow in order to play well in society we tamp down that voice do you think part of this uh, losing of curiosity is it's a, a coping mechanism to avoid discomfort? Because if I reflect on my life, uh, although I haven't gone through your life brief process, I have a few years ago kind of decided to live a bit more intentionally, right? And the scariest part of that entire process was standing at the edge of this metaphorical cliff and realizing that once I put down on paper my ambitions and my goals and what I want my life to look like, I then have a standard against which to compare myself and therefore I can objectively fail whereas if we're just going through life kind of willy-nilly seeing what happens there's there's no discomfort there's no fear of failure because we haven't we haven't written down what failure or success looks like are people perhaps timid to go ahead with this kind of process because it would include staring themselves in the mirror and for want of a better phrase calling out their own bullshit Yes, yes. People are terrified. They're afraid of the discomfort and the disappointment you're talking about, right? I don't want to disappoint the people around me. There's a lot of expectations. I don't want to disappoint myself. But how disappointed would you be if you lived a life of other people's making, of other people's definition? And we know at the end of people's lives, you know, and this is documented, um, people who spend a lot of time um, at the bridge of the crossover uh, into whatever's next is that people often have very universal shared regrets, regrets around um, what they wish they would have done, the relationships they wish they would have invested in, um, the ways that they would have spent their time if they had that do-over. In creativity, we value tension because it is tension that's going to create the most, the juiciest ideas. And I think there's a tension in life between the stuff that calls to us, the inner drive that is always beckoning, that is creating longing and craving with how do we show up 
in the very most practical senses. You know, how do we honor the expectations of others and the expectations of society and um, the responsibilities we've signed up for? And I believe it's in that agitation that we find possibility and new answers and new ways of looking at our existing um, situations or circumstances. I have found that the answers we seek lie in the questions we avoid. So yes, those questions, why do we avoid them? Because we're afraid of discomfort and disappointment. But what's on the other side is actually more electrifying than the fears would have us believe. As you were speaking there, two quotes popped into my mind. The first is one, and I'm not sure who said it, I'm sure it has been misattributed a million times, but Chris Williamson often speaks about this idea that true hell is when the person you could have been meets the person you became. And then you were speaking about the idea of these unifying regrets at the end of life. Bronnie Ware, the palliative care nurse who spoke to dying patients who couldn't go back and change it. And the, the single biggest regret was something like, I wish I'd lived a life which was true to myself and not that which others expected of me. And so this, this isn't all theoretical for you, is it? Because you tell a story of a time in your life where you were at that crossroads. And unlike most people who choose kind of atrophy and stagnation, you actually did something about it you put this into action so take me to that moment in your life tell me that story mm, this is the origin story of the life brief um and i've had so many crossroads so many emotional crossroads since um but this was a profound one i it was in my marriage it was a crisis of meaning um a deep sense of inadequacy or maybe wow maybe i've created a life that's too big for me to hold so I was married in um, 2010, I still am, but we had three young kids under the age of five. Uh, our relationship had been broken down into a series of ongoing debates, um, if not outright fights, negotiations about um, who was taking care of the children, who was bringing home the bacon. <laughs> you know, I was the primary breadwinner, but my husband was trying to start a company. And so there was so much chaos, um, mess in our lives. Beautiful mess at times, but mostly mess that we couldn't negotiate. I was deeply frustrated. I was critical. He felt cornered. It was the making of a nightmare, really, and um, I didn't know how to get out of it. And one day, sitting um, in the car, in the parking lot of the grocery store, it was pounding rain. I can still feel the, um, the sensations of the rain hitting the metal on the car. And I was in a conversation with a friend, and the most unbearable questions that were swirling in my mind came to the forefront and came out of my mouth. Um, questions like, am I with the right partner? Is he the person I can lean on? Uh, how do we hold up this big life we have created? What if I can't? What happens then? And none of the answers came in that parking lot on that rainy day. But once spoken, those questions, um, they gripped me. I call them the gripping questions. They, they, Any time I had a pause, they would emerge. Um, and three months later, I was uh, on a business trip. Late at night, I had come home from research, and I was in, my, in the quiet of my childhood bedroom. I was at my parents' home, and the questions surfaced again. And this was probably my darkest point. When I talk about agitation, this was deep, deep agitation on the verge of tears. Um, in fact, there were a lot of tears that night. And I had a reflex. I went to my strategist reflex because it was either I was going to break up my life and, um, and, and take the really terrifying road of maybe separating, or I was gonna come at this differently. And what I did reflexively was to drop in to a deeper intuition and pull up the answers 
to the question, what do I want? Not what is expected of me, not what do my parents want for me, not what do my kids need of me, but what do I want in my heart of hearts? And the questions that came out and talking about dispelling the terror, I thought my husband was the problem. In my mind, that was it. But when I started writing on the page, messy, I realized the problem was actually my relationship with time. And everything that came out of the page, came onto the page, was a pattern about how I wanted to shift that relationship with time and where I was placing my attention. And that was the first glimmer of hope. And from there, we could reset how we were approaching and living our lives in the day to day. Something really interesting you said there, and I want to touch in a minute on the parallels between strategic uh, briefs in advertising and the life brief. But you implied there that the answers were already inside of you, right? And I hear lots of people in the advertising world speak about the idea that you don't you don't come up with insight, you just find it. It's already there. It's kind of right underneath your nose. So perhaps that's a reassuring point that we can begin on here, right? That people embarking on this journey when they pick up the book and they create their own life brief, they're not having to necessarily find answers that don't exist. They're just finding what's already somewhere deep within them. Is that is that right? Yes, I call it the unlock. So we in the business, you know, strategists are there to unlock the insights and find the answers. We're not there to come up with something original that doesn't exist. Because when you're dealing with a company's essence, it's really about finding the truth that already exists, who they are and who they always have been, and what are the threads of that. And when we do research, we're really listening for those threads and pulling them together and dropping in to that essence and giving that them words, expression, that can align all of us together. It's because when we are clear and we can put it in an expressed way, and not only in an express way that is that captures the meaning, but it, in an express way that also unlocks the motivation, the inspiration, the um, unlocks a vault of ideas and possibilities for where we can take that essence. So clarity through writing, finding words that capture that essence and propel you forward into where you can take that essence is the work of strategy. And so let's dive into that work just briefly. I think that this would be a nice, uh, a nice way to set up the three sections of the life brief. So we all see ads on TV, right? We see campaigns and to, to the normal person in the street, it's just a thing that's appeared on the TV. It's just a billboard that's appeared there. But of course, lots of strategic work has gone on behind the scenes to make that what it becomes. Perhaps to, to demonstrate that parallel, you can talk about a couple of briefs that you've come up for for brands in the corporate world and then crucially how that has turned into action being manifest so that we're connecting between brief and action. Yes, um, I don't think this company exists in the UK, but um, there's a, a brilliant um, healthcare company called One Medical, and they disrupt the healthcare, the US healthcare system by um, being a membership based primary care offering. So that means primary doctors. Um, and because you pay a membership fee, you can access your doctors anytime, instantly, you know, um, uh, through remote care, or you can find an office and you can spend a lot of time with your doctor asking all the questions. And so they really um, flipped the pill hill approach to, um, to medical care. So pill hill means most of the U.S. healthcare system is built on around the hospital. Everything is located around the hospital, all of your doctor's services, even the insurance system is built around the hospital. So often people have to drive 45 minutes to an hour to reach their doctor, or they have to wait three weeks for an appointment because the system is um, so complex to navigate. And One Medical wanted to come in and really disrupt this. And their clinics are uh, located on Main Street, so near where you work, where you shop, 
where you live instead of on Pill Hill near the hospital. Um, so they were changing things in lots of ways. But the narrative about One Medical was that they were the spa of medicine. And that's because they had these wonderful lobbies and waiting rooms with cucumber water and beautiful music. And people couldn't understand why they would pay this membership fee just to have a spa-like ambiance <laughs> for One Medical. Whereas really at the heart and essence of what they were doing is they were wholesale changing the healthcare model to serve people and put people first. And they were really thinking about it in innovative ways and they had created it. So when we went in, we had so much research to do. So getting messy is the first part of a strategist's work. We're looking at all kinds of opinions and data and um, different experiences. We're studying the business and then the people who the, the audience for the business. We're speaking to people who know nothing about them. We know everything about them. We're speaking to the doctors, the nurses, the um, lobby staff. We're talking to all the technicians who create the technology. And what we uncovered was there's such a deeper resonance to the essence of this company, yet by being seen as the spa of medicine, they weren't behave, they were confused as to how did they behave and show up, right? Um, there's a confusion inside the company and also outside the company. And after a mountain of research, so I call it um, the mountain of mess, my job is to make meaning of it. My team's job at Good Be Silverstein Partner, and we have some of the most brilliant um, strategists uh, that I'm lucky to work with. What we really centered around is there is this incredible mission for One Medical to design healthcare around people and real lives. And we're now in a culture where people are deeply impatient, so we call them inpatient patients. This is the new breed of uh, audience for any uh, provider. They're used to getting ordering their car by their app. They're used to ordering their groceries and having things delivered within the hour. Why do they have to wait three weeks for their medical care? And so the strategy, the essence of One Medical became real life care. This is healthcare that is designed around people and how they really live. And once they had that essence, everything aligned. How they spoke about themselves, how they chose new locations, how they designed future offerings, and more ways that they could show up. How can they serve the mom at 2 a.m. when her child is vomiting and they don't know what's going on? Can't wait for a three-week appointment. You need answers now. So that really helped them innovate from that place of essence. That's really interesting to hear how the, the messiness of an entire organization and all of its people and all of its communication can be funneled through a single point of truth and then come out the other side making a huge amount of sense. So actually that's a really nice way to frame us now approaching the life brief, right? So as you hinted at there, there are the three steps of the life brief. They are to get messy, to get clear and to get active. Let's begin at the beginning. What is getting messy all about? Well, you can't get clear if you haven't looked at your own mess. And so most people, uh, we live in a culture that has a bias for action, right? Let's get things done. But when you're acting without that clarity, any, any road will do, any path will do, and we end up with a lot of U-turns in life or a lot of confusion. So getting messy is about sitting and reflecting and allow the answers that are within you to come up out of you and onto the page through writing, without editing, without judgment, without withholding. That in itself is a practice that people are out of practice with. We judge our thoughts, we don't, let, we don't dare let them out, much less put them in writing. But when we collect them and put them in writing, then we start to be able to have a relationship with them. 
we can stand back with perspective, with a beginner's mind, with a, a different lens than the attachments of our emotions. And when we collect them over time, let's say two weeks, let's say you spend five minutes allowing a writing practice. And you know, with strategists, we have a lot of prompts. So the book has a lot of prompts to help people think about it in different ways. And if it doesn't, one doesn't work for you, another one is there. It's a toolbox for getting messy. But once we collect it in writing, then we can sit back and reflect on it. We can sort and separate what matters from what doesn't. We can see the patterns of our thoughts. In fact, I had um, a client the other day who said, in my head, I was telling me, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. But when I looked at my writings in my notebook that I had collected over two weeks, I realized I absolutely know what I do, what I want to do, you know? It was there in many different phrases and expressions. And so that's the clarity. Once you can step back from the messiness, see what you've collected, then you get what I call ahas, insights, patterns. And then you start to see the clarity that you thought you were missing. And then once you are clear, action is a byproduct of clarity. Something magical happens when you get sharp and clear and brave about what you want. Suddenly you see your day to day, even if nothing has changed on the outside, it looks different. How you spend your time is different, where you aim your attention is different, and the decisions that seemed unusually hard feel suddenly clear. So when you were in that moment where you were you were scribbling down your own notes in your own messy phase, as you spoke about, what were some of the, the biggest surprises that struck you, right? Because uh, just, just briefly, you speak about the idea of us having a bias towards action, and we're all kind of putting up this facade publicly, aren't we? We're, we're showing the world that we definitely know what's going on, right? Whether it's the, the marriage or the children or the career or the this or that, we're, we're showing that it's all regimented and it's all perfect. But I imagine when you get messy and when you turn over some of those rocks, there are things hiding that you're like, oh, I don't quite like that. Oh, I didn't know that about myself. Did anything surprise you in your own messy phase? Yes. I mean, I, I think I spoke about it earlier, but the biggest surprise in writing my first life brief was that my husband was not my problem. I had been so convinced that my marriage was broken. My husband was the issue. Yes, that was a very arrogant and critical place to come from. But I, I didn't know how to fix him. I thought I needed to fix him in order to fix us. And when I realized through my writing that I really craved and longed for a different way to spend my time. The time was broken, that I wasn't giving the time to my children that I wanted as a parent. I wasn't investing time in my marriage, and I certainly wasn't giving any time to myself. And that's very easy for women to do, to sacrifice any attention or care for themselves in order to serve everyone else. And when that was illuminated, I could quickly, almost immediately see ways I would spend my time differently. And so getting messy seems to be this this necessary step before we get clear, right? Because if you don't have all of the variables in front of you, if you haven't spent the time with the thoughts, it's very easy, and I've definitely done this in my life before, to assume that you know best immediately and to go with whatever your, your gut or your insight tells you and then skip straight to getting active. But then as you alluded to earlier, you head weeks, months, years down the wrong path before you realize. Is that right to say that if you don't get messy, you can get active and head off in the complete wrong direction? Yes, I, that's why I say, you know, life is a series of U-turns if you aren't clear about what you want. Um, our immediate gut serves us um, and our head can be a labyrinth. It's a death trap if we think, overthink things. Um, that's, that's a very easy thing for strategists to do, to overthink. And then our gut in the moment can steer us uh, impulsively down the wrong road, right? Because we're, we're looking to satisfy something. But when you collect ingredients over time, then you start to notice patterns. You start to see 
how your gut or your emotions are informing you in the moment, but not serving you in the long run, but that there are these other voices or truths or callings beckoning to you that are coming out every day that maybe you haven't given enough attention to. But when you can see it on the page, suddenly you can zoom in on them and say, wait, what is this? This is ever present. Why is it getting over, overcrowded by the immediate thoughts or the repeat themes, you know, that play over and over again in the theater of our minds? Now you can pluck those out and say, this is what I actually want, but I've been ignoring it because I've been re reacting, not responding in my life. And so once somebody has completed the, the process of getting messy and they're about to embark on getting clear, what, what does that look like? So getting clear is all about noticing those patterns, sorting and separating what I call the meaningful from the meaningless or the meaning light. You start to bucket things, right? And then you zoom in on the things that are non-negotiable, sacred. Uh, you can't imagine life or a future without it. Those are the ingredients then that you hone in on for clarity. And writing a fuck yes life brief means that you're writing a series and no more than five declarative statements that are anchored in the right here, right now. So what I mean by that is you start each of these statements with I am, I choose, I am ready for. This is not a wish list, a bucket list, someday, if, when, you know? This is about what is urgent and important bundled up now. And every statement de declares something. You could put an exclamation mark on it. I know a lot of people um, don't want to put, you know, that kind of exclamation. But when you feel that, that's the fuck yes feeling I'm talking about. It gives you this boost and fuel of motivation that you can't deny. And that's why action is automatically born from it. So five declarative statements about what you are ready for right now in this part of your life, whether it be a relationship with someone else, a relationship with your work, or a relationship with yourself. And talk to me about the concept of, of having to choose these things in the present moment, because, you know, I've, I've read countless books, which in some way or another suggest that they're the, the path forward in life. But they, they let us off the hook too easily because they allow us to create these 10, 20, 30 year plans, these lifelong plans. And it feels amazing. I'm sure you'll agree to tell everybody about the things that you're going to do. Right. All of those feel good hormones bubble up when you tell people what you're going to achieve or what you're going to do. But when the, the rubber meets the road, because you have to begin now, because this brief is written for the now, that's a very different kettle of fish. It is. And when you take that brief, the now brief to the fuck yes feeling, it's undeniable. You, it, once you've declared it, it's hard to stuff it back into the bottle. But getting active is about living your brief in tiny yet daily ways. This is not about burning the house down, getting divorced, you know, putting your children up for adoption. This is about how do I take right now and show up differently? Show up differently in the smallest ways that I can imagine that are inexcusable, yet irresistible. And what I mean, inexcusable means you can't write it off. You can't say, I don't have time for this. And so, you know, the second time this practice saved my marriage was um, during a moment where my husband asked me the question, are you still madly in love with me? And my answer immediately, viscerally was, God, no. <laughs> After 17 years, four kids, five moves, uh, what is mad love? I didn't speak these words, but that was the truth that was coming up. But then I had to break it down into two more questions or maybe multiple questions of, do I want mad love? And that was a visceral, hell yes. I can't imagine living the rest of my life, never experiencing the fire of desire or being the subject of desire for someone else. So 
hell yes, I want mad love. And then the harder question, but do I want mad love with this person, this person who I've signed up with? And my answer was yes, after much contemplation for all kinds of reasons, including I'm a better person when I'm with him than when I'm without him. But the answer that followed was that I didn't believe it was possible. There was so much calcified between us at this moment in time that I couldn't imagine breaking through it. But I wrote the brief anyway. I'm ready to fall madly in love with my husband again. And after I wrote it, I didn't know how it was going to happen. First, I had to take a sledgehammer <laughs> to our calcified, the wall between us. And we, it, it, it felt deeply uncomfortable and it was not of my choosing. But we had some hard truths about what was standing between us and what I needed and what he needed. And after a very long night of what started as hard and heated argument ended in a hug that melted away so much that stood between us. And three days later, I started the tiny daily act of thanking him through a kiss, a momentary kiss, every time I walked out the door to work. Now, normally, when I walk out the door, he hands me a coffee, I grab it. I usually am on the phone already, and I have a child in tow, and I'm out the door. You know, not a glance, not a moment of appreciation. But this time, I stopped in my tracks. I looked him in the eyes. I leaned over. I took the coffee, and I kissed him. The surprise on his face was shocking. <laughs> Even the surprise on my kids' faces were shocking. But I walked out and I thought, why am I not doing that? Why, why was that so hard? And so I did that every day for five days. And long story short, three weeks later, we went away. We had my mom come watch the kids. We went away to celebrate our wedding anniversary. And I woke up the third morning and I thought, what is this feeling? Could it be mad love? And that lesson for us was that mad love is always available to us should we choose it. But I had to get through the mess and the questions to get clear that yes, I choose mad love even after 17 years. Something really interesting as you were explaining that that stood out to me is the idea that you had this this big question, right? This big proposition in front of you that you wanted to fall madly in love again, but you somehow found the uh, the the insight to to begin with small steps. Now, you know, I've I've read all the books, the The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. I've read Atomic Habits, and recently Jordan Peterson seems to be popping up everywhere, saying that the the way to make progress in life is you have to have the humility to realize that you need to start with something incredibly basic. And I've never heard him speak about this before. He has a big reach, so I imagine this is going to become popular sometime soon. That people realize that big action comes from small, daily, easy tasks. But how did you arrive at that insight to think, you know what, to to get this huge unlock? I need to do something so basic, so so simple that it may even feel silly to think that this can lead to that. The honest answer is that it wasn't possible. It, the, the big leaps were too terrifying. I had to figure out a way to, um, to cut it into bite-sized pieces. And what I've learned over time is that my paralysis, my deepest fears, my greatest anxieties come when I build something up to its biggest form. But when I can break it down to only the next step, only the first step that I can see right in front of me, suddenly that fear and tension evaporate, they dissipate, they break down. And all I do is focus on all my presence on that singular next action and I can breathe. And so it's a visceral experience. And now I have proof in my own life that that works. I wrote a book 
through the pandemic uh, with four kids and shepherding them through the pandemic and running an agency uh, in uncertain business times. But I knew every Sunday morning at the dining room table, creating something, putting my words into expression, that that would go somewhere. And there were terrifying moments where I thought, how the hell am I going to do this? People do this, you know, 5 a.m. daily rituals of three hours of writing, or that's how I imagine writers work. But all I had were Sunday mornings and maybe Friday nights. Um, and it is possible. I am telling you, whether you want to turn around a relationship that you thought was broken or you want to achieve something audacious in your life that is brimming and wanting to burst out of you, it can happen in the smallest slivers of dedicated time. I'm smiling as you, you said about the 5 a.m. rituals there because I seem to be on this warpath recently against the perception that you need to have a 5 a.m. ritual, right? You need to wake up and have the ice bath and journal and go to the gym and listen to your audiobook and get your protein in and all these different things. And it seems, although this seems like a tangent, it seems almost that the antithesis of all of that is just having a life brief, right? It's having those five really clear things that you look at and you say, fuck yeah, this is what I want in life. And because so many people lack that, so few of us know where we're going, we fill the void with all of this busy work that that seems good, right? Because maybe Andrew Huberman on a podcast told you to do it or you saw an Instagram post telling you to do it, but actually it's not moving you towards that person you could be. Is that right? That when you have the clarity, it doesn't need to be overly complicated because you know the steps and therefore the, the trivial kind of distractions block themselves out. That's exactly right. When we, Those are all good advice. I'm Andrew Humerman. I'm a huge fan. You know, everything he says is brilliant. But is it right for me? That's the thing, right? If we skip over getting messy and getting clear, then all the advice and actions, we could take them on. But what I've learned is you can't have it all. You can't do it all. But you can have all that matters to you. The question is, do you know what matters to you? Are you clear about that? Because if not, then you're going to try all these methods, all these um, tactics, and they will fall away over time. They're not going to stick. What makes something sticky is that clarity, that clarity of self, that essence of what you want and only you want. It might not be only you, but it's distinctly you. Can you think of an example of an opportunity that, say, five, ten years ago, you would have just instinctually, system one, said, yep, going to do that because it's, it's an opportunity and opportunities are good, that, that now you have these briefs in your life, now you have this clarity and this filter, you've said, actually, that would be amazing, but it's, it's just not for me. Yeah, <laughs> I can name things very recently. Um, I've been, you know, I've had a brilliant career, uh, an amazing ride um, as a strategist. Um, I think I have a, m many years to go, but I was recently offered, um, not offered, but uh, I'm going to start over. I was recently given an opportunity for a bigger leadership role. Um, and in my heart, it did not ring true to my latest work brief. And I pulled back from it. And it was really hard. It was a it was hard decision because there was an opportunity to really go for it and lean into it. And it spoke loudly to my ego and my sense of, yes, what's next in my career. It felt like the natural next step that people take in um, in the same spheres. And it was really emotionally hard to separate my ego and my calling. And what I realized is if I said yes, it would be saying yes to deep responsibility that would take me away from the other parts, my joy work or my ability to serve people in lasting and meaningful ways, which are deep parts of my true brief. And so at that crossroads, it took many months, but I was able to get clear with myself that no, chasing that was not the right direction. And in this, this active mode that somebody will be in once they've created a brief and they've got going, 
is there a mechanism by which we can decide whether we're we're following that brief right we've spoken about these visceral feelings and in some areas where there are heightened emotions or something that's a little bit more passionate that makes sense right but if it's if it's something that's kind of run of the mill but an area of your life that you still want to be moving forward on is there a mechanism by which we can reliably and objectively measure that success against the brief well your brief evolves as you evolve so this is i, I want to make sure that this isn't about holding you something to something that um, becomes outdated as you live your life because this is a practice of getting connected to your innermost truth. And as that truth evolves and changes and deepens and grows, your brief should evolve with it. This is not about setting up a plan that you are now beholden to. And come hell or high water, you better deliver on it. This is not that. Strategy is informed by where we are right now and where we want to go. It is the bridge between the two. And as that takes new shape, so should your strategy, right? That's how it works in the corporate world. Um, and I have briefs that I have long discarded because they're outdated, life briefs. I also have briefs, life briefs that are timeless, that seem to be ever present. And when I reread them, I still get that fuck yes feeling. So this is a practice of connecting to you. Like we said at the beginning of this conversation, we aren't training our kids. We aren't teaching our young people how to do this practice. And that's what's at the heart of this book really is to get us in touch with the voice that is our own and be able to distinguish and separate that voice from the loudness of the world around us. I was smiling as you said that because I, I wish I had found your book six months earlier for the sole reason, and this this is going to seem really meta to talk about the podcast on the podcast with a guest, um, but those who have been listening to this podcast for a while will know that this year I have been incredibly inconsistent with it, right? So this this podcast for context is like four years old, 100 75 180 episodes right but this year was just incredibly inconsistent and it's because in many ways as i hear you explain this back to me it was a a previous brief for one of a better phrase although it wasn't actually a brief a previous version of myself that i was feeling beholden to right and so it went from feeling like this thing that i really wanted to do because it connected to values and it connected to where i was going to a chore and it, it took me a good six months nine months to get back to the point where actually today we're recording this first guest episode in about six or seven months because there is now a a new north star that i'm heading towards and the content makes more sense now but the the pain and almost the guilt for one of a better phrase because i i felt that i had to stick to that previous version of myself it just the the discomfort crept in slowly but in such a way that it just didn't feel good so it is nice to hear that actually you know these briefs we don't need to live by them forever we can live by them until they don't serve us and then just make a new one that's right. And good for you, Sean. Good for you for taking that time. And that's your own messy m messiness coming through, right? And you needed the space and time to do it. I love Meta. I don't mean the company, but I, I love Meta because I am living the life brief as I'm writing and teaching and speaking about the life brief. So it gets messy. And the same with my newsletter. I went dark for two months and I felt terrible guilt and because I hold responsibility to serve the audience, but I can't serve the audience if I'm not being real about what it takes to serve the audience. And I think, I suspect it's the same for you and whatever you have reimagined for your audience in your podcast, that is going to be the gift that keeps on giving. It's interesting. It's, um, and I'm sure you're the same with your newsletter. It's this funny kind of I can't think of a phrase to describe it accurately, but when you put content on the internet, everybody assumes that you have your shit together, right? Because you're the person telling people this thing or that thing and they consume it and then they go and action it in their lives. But actually it is nice to just sometimes break the fourth wall and be like, I have no idea what I'm doing right now, but we're going to work it out and we're going to work it out together. And that actually was one of the most rewarding parts of this podcast over the past few months is having that messiness, as you put it, public. 
I've been sharing on this podcast that I didn't know where things were going and, and now we're there. It feels amazing, right? I have that clarity and I'm, I'm getting active. It is the most important thing I think public figures can do and leaders, and it is my leader, part of my leadership experience, is that uh, it doesn't serve anyone to think that public personalities are perfect and polished. And I certainly don't think it serves young people coming up in their careers to see leaders that way. And, you know, coming through my industry as a woman, as a Asian woman, uh, it was hard because you're facing scarcity all the time. And when you think there's only one or two slots at the top for women, now you're going to behave in a different way. But the reality is we know middle management, you know, people in those middle ranks of their career, they drop out because they think they look up and they they don't see themselves represented. They look at their own lives and they, they think I'm a hot mess. How could I ever be that? I'm not that. And they immediately take themselves out of the game. And I believe the more open public figures are like yourself and leaders are like myself, the more we can actually show the path to those destinations, whether it be, you know, out into the world, onto the stage, um, in front of the mic, or at the top of a company, that it is the challenges, it is the messiness that forges and forms who you are and how you lead. And that's why it's really important for me to openly live my life brief so that people can see, oh yes, I can do it too. So I want to conclude this conversation in the same place that you conclude the book about how short life is, right? So there are going to be people listening to this who perhaps aren't entirely convinced that they need a life brief. They, they know that their life perhaps isn't going the way they want it to, but they're not quite ready to take that step and commit to the action. Now you have their ear. What would you tell them with all you know about communication and getting messages across to really drive home the message that, that life is short, our time on this earth is brief and that we need to do something about it. I want to say that you're not a victim or a passenger of your life. We are conditioned to believe that we only have two choices ever. The life is binary. Uh, it's yes or no, this or that, stay or leave. And coming from a creative industry, I have seen time and again the rainbow of possibilities. <laughs> The, and I have experienced the heightened sensation of coming up with something that's alternate to what society believes, but yet so true to me. And when you live that way, you end each day still exhausted because life is not easy in any shape or form. But you can end your days feeling soul satisfied soul spent satisfied or wrung out empty. That's your choice. And I find soul satisfaction comes from living from a place that is deeper than what you believe others are wanting from you. And if you are willing and want to live that kind of life, to experience what that feels like, this is what it takes. And yes, we've all learned in the last four years that life is brief. So make it meaningful by making it yours. Amazing. Bonnie Wan, thank you so much for this. I'm going to make sure that your brand new book is linked to the show notes. It's out on the 16th of January here in the UK. Um, if people want to go elsewhere to find you, to discover your work, to sign up to your newsletter, where can they go? They can go to thelifebrief.com and uh, there are resources and all kinds of ways that this is going to take new forms. So yes, buy the book. Also follow me on uh, Instagram and uh, LinkedIn under my name, Bonnie Wan. Um, but thelifebrief.com is where everything is centralized. And you can follow me as my messiness continues to journey out in the day-to-day. -day. Um, I have a newsletter where I share all the messiness as well as the tools and practices that help me through the messiness in the week to week.